hopefully the technology will cooperate. Um, I, as Anne said, I work at the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, and we are the state agency charged with protecting public health and the environment. And one of those elements is solid waste management. And one of our goals is to reduce waste that's disposed. So composting is a great way we can all use to, um, to reduce our household waste. Um, in, the, in the process, we, it also helps to reduce greenhouse gas emissions because landfilling organic matter converts it to methane, whereas composting it um, converts it to um, carbon products, one of which is humus. And in the form of humus, carbon is sequestered or stored in the soil for hundreds of years. It, it, it pretty much locks it in. So it's a, it's a small amount, we might think, but it all adds up. And it's a great thing for your soil as well, because it adds nutrients and organic matter that your plants all need. It's nature's recycling system, basically. And then as an individual or a household, you can save money, or as a town, you can save money. If people compost their waste, that much waste won't, go, won't need to be paid for as disposed tonnage. And you won't have to buy as many bags, and there won't be as many trucks that need to um, to drive around to collect that part of your of your waste. So, what can be composted? Pretty much anything that was once alive is an organic chemist um, structure, and bacteria and other decomposers are able to break apart anything that was once alive and eat it up and converted in the process into a decomposed material we call compost. Um, that includes food waste, paper products, which as you know, comes from trees. So as long as you keep the plastic coating off of the paper and um, try, I try to minimize the ink, although ink has not been found to be a problem. That's an optional thing. Um, but these are tree products and they will compost just like leaves or, or or sawdust or any other tree product. And that includes yard waste like leaves, pine needles, grass clippings, weeds, prunings, wood chips, sawdust, all these things. And a lot of times we wanna clean up our yards and get rid of all those things, but I think of them as compost waiting to happen. So don't let any of that stuff leave your yard if, if you can help it, because it vastly improves your soil. Manures like horse and cow manure, um, Dog and cat manure I'll talk about later, but generally in a backyard system, you don't want to compost those um, ingredients. Seaweed has full of minerals, so if you live near the ocean, you can take advantage of that. And the list goes on. But what exactly that you put in your compost pile, or what exactly gets put in any compost system depends upon the compost system used. And today we're gonna to be focusing on home composting or backyard composting. Um, just real quickly, about 25% of the overall material in the waste stream consists of food scraps and um, prunings and grass clippings and compostable paper. So by composting, you can actually compost as much as 50% of your household waste or more depending, for instance, if you're a vegetarian, you'd be able to compost pretty much all your food scraps. Um, so, and if you use paper products, you can compost pretty much all of those as well. So all you have left to recycle to is to items you can recycle or plastic um, film material packaging that there's no um, recycling program for. But other than that, you can really minimize your, your food waste and, and, and all your organic waste. So how many different ways are there to compost? I think there's probably a million um, because there's so many different var variations on the theme that you can use. And that can be on site, like in your backyard or at a school, in bins or even in trash cans that you can convert or buckets or worm bins indoors if you don't have a yard or just open piles if you live out in an, in an ur rural area and um, you just want to compost in an, in an open pile, you can do that as well. Municipal and on-farm composting operations usually use windrows, piles, or drums. 
And then there's commercial systems that could be in enclosed containment vessels. They get more high tech as, as they increase in size usually. Aerobically, which um, is with the presence of oxygen, the byproducts of that are carbon dioxide and humus. And that's what we do with backyard composting. And then there's another type of decomposition called anaerobic decomposition, and that produces methane. It happens inside our stomachs, and it happens in anaerobic digestion systems, which then use that methane, also called, can be called natural gas, and use it to power their, their, um, their facility. So that's another, there's all different kinds of ways to compost. And who can compost? Everyone. It's an equal opportunity activity. You can do it at home, at work, at school, at play, on the farm, in your basement, on the porch, or your deck, in the woods, or in the garden. Why not? Really, no reason not to compost. And with that, I am going to show you a video. So hang on while I try and change my screen. And we do have a question. Um, okay. I'll take Do communities it. usually have restrictions or regulations on composting types? Yes, municipalities usually take, uh, are very specific about what they will accept in a municipal program. It may be leaves and yard waste, um, which is just anything from your yard, although if it's branches, they, it usually needs to be smaller than a half inch in diameter and less than a few feet long. Um, and if they collect food waste from your municipality, then they will have, um, whoever does that program will have their own instructions for what they accept. So if you're using a municipal program, you should check with the municipality or the service provider to see what exactly is um, going to be um, accepted. Now this video I'm going to show you is produced by the state of Connecticut back in 1992 from um, using a grant from the Environmental Protection Agency. It cost about $17,000 to produce and um, so it was a great pr um, effort and I contributed to the um, to the script and um, Connecticut put all the um, material together and created it. One note I'll make is that it predates our compost bins that we now distribute. So um, I will be talking about those after the video. The video is about 15 minutes long. It's also, I call it a three fur because it's not just um, composting. It also talks about recycling your grass clippings and mulching your, your um, wood products, your branches and, and sticks and stuff. So it's, it's um, if you have a yard, these are all things you can do. If you don't have a yard, you can share the information with people you know who do so that they can take advantage of all these materials. When the video starts, it's got music that's kind of loud, loud and then when the narrator starts, he's um, softer. So you might need to turn up your volume once the speaker starts. So with that, let's see if I can um, get this um, video going. And also this is available on Connecticut DEP's website. So if if you want to watch it later or use it, you can use it to give your own presentations. And it makes it quite simple because it covers the whole process um, in about 15 minutes. So with that, here we go. composting is our way of speeding up and enhancing mother nature's decomposition process on the forest floor it may take several years before leaves are transformed by naturally occurring organisms into rich organic soil but by composting you can create conditions under which these organisms will flourish turning your yard and kitchen waste into a free beneficial soil amendment for your garden lawn and potted plants in a matter of months home composting is less expensive and more efficient than transferring organic wastes to an incinerator landfill or even a centralized composting facility it is environmentally sound can be done almost anywhere 
and enables householders to substantially reduce their trash. This program explains the basics of how to recycle your yard and kitchen waste through home composting, describes how to use your yard waste as mulch, and explains the importance of leaving grass clippings on the lawn. Home composting is not difficult or time-consuming. Most of the work is done by soil organisms, bacteria, molds, fungi, beetles, centipedes, insects, and earthworms are just some of the organisms which work together to decompose or recycle organic materials into humus. Like us, they need food, oxygen, and water for survival. Food for the microbes is your yard waste and kitchen scraps. These contain carbon for energy and nitrogen for growth and reproduction. Dry, woody things like dead autumn leaves, straw, paper, and sawdust are high in carbon. Fresh, moist materials like grass clippings, vegetable scraps, garden waste, coffee grounds, and manures are good sources of nitrogen. Composting a diverse mix of materials generally results in a good balance of carbon and nitrogen. Oxygen must be available for aerobic organisms to thrive. Oxygen can be supplied by periodically turning or mixing the pile with a pitchfork or by poking holes in it with a broom handle or special aeration tool. Aeration keeps the compost pile from developing unpleasant odors. Water is essential. With too little water, the organisms will slow down and can die. Too much water will eliminate oxygen and odors may result. The material in the pile should be kept as damp as a wrung out sponge. Countless things can be composted at home. Citrus rinds, vegetable stalks and peelings, spoiled fruit and vegetables, coffee grounds, coffee filters and tea bags, eggshells, peanut shells, straw, weeds, garden waste and paper towels to name a few. But not everything belongs in the compost pile. Do not add meat or fish scraps, bones, fats, grease, oil, peanut butter, or dairy products such as milk, cheese, butter, mayonnaise, and yogurt. These foods can attract pests or cause odors. Do not add diseased plants, weeds that have gone to seed, or the roots of invasive plants such as quackgrass, wild morning glory, and bittersweet, which may survive the composting process and take root where the finished compost is used. Dog and cat waste can carry parasites transmittable to humans and should not be added to the pile. Using a compost bin to contain your organic materials may be preferable to an open compost pile because it discourages animals, makes the pile easier to manage, helps retain heat and moisture, and tends to look neater. There are many kinds of ready-made bins available through garden centers, department stores, and other retail outlets. Some are small and designed specifically for kitchen waste. These are referred to as digesters. Others are large enough to accommodate both yard and kitchen waste. With little expense and effort, you can build your own bin using scrap lumber, fencing, cinder blocks, pallets, or a combination of materials. A bin must be at least three feet wide, three feet long, and three feet high to provide enough mass to retain the heat generated by the microbes. It shouldn't be bigger than five feet in any dimension for ease of handling and to prevent compaction. The bin usually has an open base which provides drainage and allows the composting materials to come in contact with natural soil organisms. A top is optional. Making sure that only the appropriate food scraps are added to the pile is the best method for keeping animals out of your compost. However, animal-proof bins can be purchased commercially or made by drilling quarter-inch holes in the sides, bottom, and top of a trash can with a tight locking lid. A wooden bin can be animal-proofed by lining it with half-inch metal mesh and securing a top. How fast composting takes place depends on the kinds of materials you add to the pile and the amount of time you're willing to dedicate to composting. 
The art of composting is simply balancing certain factors, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and moisture, to convert organic items into a rich humus within the time frame you have chosen. If you have little time to spend on composting and there's no hurry for a finished compost, you may want to try the passive method using a holding bin. It is one of the easiest ways to compost, since no labor is required other than placing wastes in the bin and harvesting the compost from the bottom of the pile about 8 to 12 months later. If you have a large volume of organic wastes or want finished compost sooner, the active method may be more appropriate, using a turning unit. Turning units typically consist of a series of bins or a rotating barrel. This is an active method because the pile is periodically turned or moved into the next bin, which supplies oxygen to the organisms, allowing them to break down the wastes quickly. Weekly aeration can result in finished compost in less than two months. Whichever method you choose, passive or active, the recipe for creating a compost pile is the same. Start by placing your bin in a convenient location with good drainage. It can be in the sun or shade. Gather some materials to be composted, keeping in mind diversity, texture, carbon, and nitrogen. Chopping or shredding the material will help speed up the composting process. Put a layer of dry, woody, high carbon materials, such as leaves, straw, or sawdust from untreated wood, in the bottom of the bin. Sprinkle with water to dampen the materials to the consistency of a wrung out sponge. Then add a layer of moist, nitrogen rich materials, such as grass clippings, garden spoils, and cow or horse manure. The thickness of the layers isn't critical, but no layer should be more than six inches deep. Mix the two layers together. A shovel full of soil or finished compost every so often will add even more organisms to the pile. Continue alternating, mixing, and watering the layers as materials become available or until the bin is full. Don't be surprised if the compost pile is warm on the inside within a few days. Heat is a normal byproduct of composting and indicates that the microorganisms are working to break down the materials. Over time, the volume of material in the bin will shrink. Appropriate kitchen scraps can be added as they become available and should be buried in the center of the pile. Keep a container on the counter while preparing meals to easily collect the kitchen scraps. The container of scraps may be covered and stored in the refrigerator or under the counter until it is emptied into the compost bin. You can continue to put food scraps, coffee grounds, houseplant cuttings and other organic items into the pile throughout the year. The composting process will slow down during the winter months but will speed up again when spring arrives. Leaves alone will compost, but it will take a bit longer than if they are mixed with grass clippings, manure, or other nitrogen-rich materials. Although not essential, shredding leaves with a rotary lawnmower or home shredder will accelerate the composting process and quickly reduce their volume when space for composting is limited. You'll know that your compost is ready to harvest when it is dark brown, crumbly, earthy smelling, and no longer resembles the original material. If you have used the passive method, the more finished compost will be found near the bottom of the pile. You may want to screen your compost to remove pieces of woody materials, eggshells, and other items that have not totally decomposed, and return them to the compost bin. Finished compost is referred to as black gold by experienced gardeners because they know how valuable it is. Compost restores life to soil by helping to retain moisture, improve texture, and reduce erosion. It provides plants with essential nutrients in a time-release fashion. Compost may be incorporated into your vegetable or flower gardens about one month before planting by applying a three-inch layer of compost and mixing it thoroughly into the top four to six inches of soil. Compost can be used as a side dressing during the growing season and mixed into each transplant hole or seed furrow.
make a nutrient-rich potting soil, mix equal amounts of finished compost, soil, and sand. You can use screened compost as a lawn top dressing by spreading it uniformly on the surface to a depth of one-eighth to one-quarter inch. Composting is not the only way to reduce and recycle your yard waste. Shred your leaves and brush into a mulch to use around plants, trees, and shrubs or on slopes. Mulch reduces weed problems, adds nutrients to the soil, moderates soil temperature and moisture, and helps control erosion by protecting the soil surface. Woody mulches are best used in perennial gardens, under trees and shrubs, and as pathway material. Leaves and dried grass clippings are good mulches for annual vegetable and flower gardens. Leaves should be shredded and allowed to degrade slightly before being used. And dried grass clippings should be applied less than one inch thick to prevent matting. Mulching with grass clippings, which have been treated recently with herbicides, can harm your plants. As a precaution, mulch with clippings from treated lawns only after two lawn mowings. Grass clippings can account for up to 50% of your waste during the growing season. Don't bag and dispose of your grass clippings. If they are not composted or used as mulch, leave them on the lawn where they can help improve the soil. Each bag of grass clippings is equivalent to a quarter pound of usable nitrogen. During dry spells, clippings left on the lawn help retain moisture in the soil. You can conserve water, reduce the amount of money you spend on fertilizers and garbage bags, and save lots of your own time and energy by recycling grass clippings back into the lawn. To maintain your lawn properly, cut your lawn when it is dry. Mow when it is three to four inches tall, and never cut it shorter than two inches. Use a sharp mower blade and avoid over-fertilizing your lawn. Turf experts agree that clippings do not contribute to thatch. The fact is, grass clippings are almost 80% moisture and decompose quickly. As you have seen, helping to reduce, reuse, and recycle our yard and kitchen wastes is easy and can be very rewarding. Whether you are motivated by having the best garden in the neighborhood, improving our environment, or saving money, home composting, mulching, and leaving grass clippings on the lawn are the smart things to do. To learn more, write the Connecticut Department of Environment. That's great, Anne. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Can you still hear the video? Yes, you can still hear the video. All right, hold on one second. I have to manage to turn this off. Here we go. All right. So there's a couple of things that came in um, while we were watching the video. I just want to get to those before we get started. Great. So um, one person just wanted to know about composting for apartments and if there's policies um, that apartment complexes might have, but I don't, you might be addressing that later. So it's up to you if you want to wait and get that later. Uh, no, I'll tell you right now, if you live in a rental unit, you really should get the, um, agreement from your landlord um, to be able to compost unless you don't want to do that and then you can compost indoors using a worm bin um, but if you do generally if you have a landlord you should get you should get their approval before you start composting outdoors great um, and then somebody asked if you don't have access to leaves regularly is there an alternative absolutely Yes, cardboard is a great alternative. So is paper. If you have any excess paper bags, you can rip those up and use that. In fact, you can collect your kitchen scraps in a paper bag. And then when you dump it in your compost pile, rip up the bag and you'll get carbon in at the same time. 
Anything else? And then um, do the same rules that the, I believe the question would be, do the same rules that the video was talking about apply for smaller indoor compost containers? Um, the same rules for apartment dwellers? No, I think, I think, and Sarah, maybe just follow up with your question um, if you can. I think she's asking the rules in terms of um, the layering and turning and adding moisture and things like that. Yes, it is very similar. It's pretty much the same, except that with an indoor system, I personally prefer to use paper as a carbon source. And can you see the screen now that says composting is easy? Yep, yep, all good. So this, this shows you all your options for browns. And since that video came out, we developed a recipe of three parts brown to one part green. Now all browns can be, actually that can be more than three parts. You can compost all browns by themselves. For instance, you can have a, just a leaf pile and as long as it's damp, it will compost perfectly well. Um, however, with the green material that's high in nitrogen, that can cause odors if you compost too much of it or you compost it by itself. Like if you've ever smelled a, a pile of grass clippings that's been sitting in the sun for a couple of days and you dig into that, um, you might get knocked over by the stink. So green items should not be composted alone. So we developed this recipe by volume because we assume nobody's gonna be weighing their leaves and food scraps. So this is a volume-based recipe and it's, a, it's not exact. You can just do it by approximately three times as much brown stuff as green stuff. And the easiest way of doing that, I find, is to fill my bin up, whether it's an indoor worm bin or an outdoor compost bin, fill it up with browns about three quarters of the way. So in the fall, get some leaves. In the spring, you might get some leaves. If you don't have any leaves, you might be able to get some leaves from the neighbors when their this town collects um, yard waste. You might actually be able to pilfer a few of those bags of leaves and save them, because in the summer, it can be difficult to come up with enough browns. Um, another easy way of getting browns is to buy a bale of mulch hay or salt marsh hay and you just put that near your compost bin and then every time you need more more browns you can just um, shake up some of that um, mulch or, or hay or in, into your um, uh, cover your pile so there's all these different options um, so anyway back to the recipe we say about three parts brown to one part green and so the easiest way is to fill your bin up three quarters of the way with browns like leaves or shredded paper. Now, if you don't have leaves, you can also take newspapers, um, which you also might not have anymore. But if you have newspapers, you can just hold them at the top and rip them into strips. And those also make a good source of carbon. And then once you have your pile filled with a lot of the brown material, you want to dampen it add a little bit of soil because that will add the microbes that will do the work for you after about every 12 inches of fresh material. And then from that point on, you can just take your food scraps and either outside or in your worm bin and, and dig a hole with your little cultivator or a little trowel um, into your leafy material, throw in your food scraps, cover it back over with the leafy material and the carbon material will last for about half a year or more. So you only have to do that really one time. So that's why if you start with a bunch of carbon, you can bury your, your green material into it for like the rest of the year and then just start over again the following year. So that's the recipe. And as far as the green- We've got a couple questions on right. the recipe stuff. So one person asked, what's wrong with peanut butter? Great on question. The do not there's nothing wrong with peanut butter on the, um, but it's used for trapping rodents in the wild and and in the homes. <laughs> peanut butter makes a great um, bait for mice and rats, and so that's why we don't want it in the compost pile because it might attract them to your pile. That's the only reason. There's no reason otherwise why it couldn't be composted. So, so even if you had an like, indoor like worm bin, then it would be fine. Be a problem. Right, because I've never seen a worm bin develop a rodent problem. And I'll show you some images of some of a worm bin I made so you can see a plastic container and it has a cover and it's all enclosed so the mice and rats won't go won't go near it. 
Great. And then the follow up, questions? somebody is saying they've, they've heard that they should keep bread out of the compost. Is that a problem? Bread is not really a problem in a compost pile. It might attract animals. That's one of the reasons it may, you, you can see it in different instructions. You'll see either to add it or not to add it. Um, it's sort of optional. One issue I found with bread is that if it gets moldy and you haven't covered it, it can be a little um, icky to, to breathe that black mold. You don't want to breathe that in. So if you do compost bread products, just make sure you cover it with the carbon material and it should be fine. Okay, and the last one so far, um, somebody's asking if you use the term greens and browns when you're teaching composting to kids because there's a lot of exceptions to that color rule, like a green, a green is brown coffee grounds. So it doesn't yeah. get confusing for kids. Yes, um, we do use the browns and greens and we say, but not everything that's in this green category may necessarily, everything may, that's in the green category may not necessarily be green. Um, it's just that most of them are. The other alternative words you can use are, um, Browns is shorthand for high carbon, and greens is shorthand for high nitrogen. So if you want to teach the little kids those terms, go for it. <laughs> awesome. Any Thank other questions? Sure. Any other questions? So far? Um, yeah, we just got somebody asking about eggshells that are not hard boiled. Yeah, eggshells are fine. Um, some people rinse them out if they're concerned about a, a potential salmonella or something, but I've really never heard of that happening. What I found with eggshells, if, if you don't crush them up, they tend to linger for years because they're mainly um, a mineral, they're mainly calcium. And so um, they're good for your soil and your plants because they bring calcium to, to them. But I usually crush mine just simply in my hand or if I am wearing gloves in the with wearing gloves so I don't cut myself. Um, so crush them up and throw them in. And I, I, and why, I always say wash your hands after you compost or garden. That's just sort of a rule of thumb. And so if you throw stuff in your compost pile and you don't have gloves on, just wash your hands afterwards. It, you'll be fine. Uh, any other questions? Great, we're ready to move on, I think. All right, great. Well, while I still have this picture up, um, I will say this picture or something similar to it is available on the DEP website. You're welcome to print it out and also to use it if you give presentations of your own. Um, so you can see the browns and greens. I say mix or layer materials. You can do it either way. You can either mix everything up all together or you can just do it as, a, a, as they add materials as they become available. You just want to make sure that you always cover your food scraps with a layer of leaves or paper or other high carbon material. And what that does is it keeps the odors down. It's almost if you think of a carbon filter as filtering out odors. I'm not sure if that's exactly how it works, but it achieves that. So carbon is your, your filter from odors. So always keep your pile covered with a layer of car high carbon material. And then, as I said, after every 12 inches or so of fresh material, add a few shovelfuls of rich soil or compost. That will get your decomposers in, and I'll talk about more about those in a minute. You want to use outdoor soil, unless you're using a worm bin, in which case um, you don't really need to do that. You, when, you get, when you add your worms, there will be enough microbes on there to, to get the compost going. I'll talk more about the worms details in a minute. Um, and then keep it damp and aerated. Now dampness can be something you add with a hose or the rain can, and snow can get in to, to dampen it. But if you don't dampen it with a hose, make sure the rain and snow can get in. So if you have a bin with a solid cover and, it's, and the stuff in there will tend to dry out because generally as these microbes breathe, they um, evaporation, transpiration and evaporation will happen. The moisture will go into the air and your pile will dry, tend to dry out. All compost piles generally tend to dry out. So um, make sure you take the cover off when it's going to rain so the water can get back in. And then as far as- Is there as like an ideal frequency in terms of uh, dampening? We had a question, do you make sure it's damp all the time or do you water intermittently? Well, for an outdoor pile, you want it to be damp pretty much all the time. And, um, and 
as a general rule of thumb, I find that if the garden is dried out and the plants are wilted, I, I put some water in the compost pile, but you may not always get around to it. And also, if, if you have a fairly large pile, the top may dry out, the outside part may dry out, but it should still be damp in the middle. So once it's good and damp, I would say you, don't, you shouldn't really have to water it more than once a month. And if you add wet material to it, that's another way of getting moisture in, is if you add some coffee grounds or some lettuce, or things that are high in moisture, that will add moisture as well. It's mainly the leafy stuff that tends to, to really be a problem if it dries out. Um, and then as far as aeration, um, there's, there's two main ways of getting air into a compost. The, I'm gonna just jump ahead to these organisms. Who does, why we say composting is easy is because 99% of the work is done by these microbes, these decomposers, and you want them in your bin. They, these include bacteria and mold and fungi, as well as earthworms and mites and nematodes, and then larger organisms that eat, eat these other organisms like centipedes and ants and beetles and things like that. These guys all work together and they all need the same things we do, air, water, and food. So that's why if your pile dries out, the bacteria will just go dormant and things will just slow down. If it gets too wet, then they'll, all the air spaces will get filled with water so they won't be able to breathe and then they will tend to die and get odors. So you don't want it too wet as well. And in a minute, I'm gonna talk, you want it to be about 50% moisture. Um, but let me just go back to, so as far as the aeration, what I was saying is that one way to get, keep your compost aerated for those microbes is to turn it. And you could turn it with a pitchfork or a, or a shovel. But um, there's an alternative to that, which is you can build your pile with air, air passages in it. And so you can put coarse material in the bottom. I think they showed that in the video. Put coarse material in the bottom and every so often add some coarse material. And that will, should allow, as long as there's air holes in the compost container, that should allow enough air to get in there passively. So you don't necessarily have to turn your compost pile. And then if you can buy a compost bin design that helps with the aeration, then that's another way you can make aerating it easier. But don't let turning compost be a barrier for you because it, most piles can get more, enough air just um, from passive aeration. So I consider turning compost to be optional. And then let me just quickly go through the things of what, of what we don't recommend adding. Meat bones and grease and dairy products generally will smell really bad and they'll either attract animals or they will repel you and your neighbors uh, because of the stink. So you don't want that. So, um, and then peanut butter, as I said, is used to trap rodents. So that might attract them to your pile. So try to keep that out for an outdoor pile. Um, dairy products also can smell bad. Cooked foods with sauces or butter, like macaroni and cheese, it might smell so good that it might attract animals. Dog and cat manure, but otherwise cooked foods are fine. There's no reason you can't compost cooked foods. We're just saying if you want to be conservative, keep the sauce out and the butter out because it might smell too good. Um, dog and cat manure can carry pathogens that can be transmitted to humans. That's the reason we don't recommend adding that. Diseased plants, some of those diseases may be able to carry over through the compost into your, um, when you use the compost. So try to keep diseased plants out, such as like if you grow roses and the, the roses get black spot, which is a fungal disease, I never add those to my compost pile because that will just spread it more. Weeds that have gone to seed um, can sprout in your compost when you use it. Um, if you're using your compost when down in the ground when you plant, then that's less of a concern because it's buried. But if you're going to spread compost over your lawn, then you don't want everything, every weed you've pulled to come back up. So the trick to that is just try to pull the weeds out before they go to seed or before they get flowers on them. That may be easier said than done. So if they've gone to seed, you can just chop off the bottom part into the compost and then throw the seed head into the trash. You don't want them reproducing. And then weeds that spread by roots and runners can often take root when you use your compost. So it's better not to add bittersweet or um, poison ivy or other vines. Poison ivy you don't want to um, burn or compost. 
I generally, it's one of those materials that's really not suitable for composting. So it's actually okay to, to put it in the trash. Wash your hands afterwards, of course, and use gloves. So yeah, this is your workforce. Um, and do we have any other questions that have come in? We do. So we have somebody asking if it's effective to bury food scraps in the yard. Yes. Yes, you can bury your food scraps directly in the soil. I'm glad you asked that because I do that with banana peels. When I, um, I don't want to put banana peels in my worm bin because they might um, result in fruit flies. Fruit flies, we may all get fruit flies just by virtue of having fruit in our kitchens or dining rooms. And what happens is the, the fruit flies in the tropics may lay their eggs on the fruit on the surface of the bananas or the oranges. And then three days later in your house, they hatch and you have fruit flies. So I tend to try to put banana, and banana peels are a favorite of fruit flies. In fact, you can use banana peels as bait to trap fruit flies in case you get them. Um, whether you do worm composting or not, you might want to trap fruit flies. Um, so um, I put my banana peels out in my garden. They're high in potassium and supposedly they're good for roses. So I just put them out around the rose bushes and cover them with the mulch and they um, disappear in about a week. And you can do that with other food waste as well. That's an old, old fashioned practice or an old practice of tradition of composting is just burying the, the food scraps directly in the soil, covering it over. And then the next year, that's where you put your garden bed and um, there'll be worms there and the soil will be really rich. So that's, and then the next year you, you bury your food scraps in the garden path. And then the next year you move and put your garden bed that, there. So certainly do that. Any other questions? Yeah, one more. Is there any concern using pressure treated wood for compost bins? Yes. I would not recommend it. Pressure treated wood has some um, some chemicals, basically some arsenic and copper and and some um, basically some toxic chemicals that can um, they it's possible they could leach out into your compost. And also if you build a raised bed, we generally I wouldn't recommend using pressure treated wood for that because you never really know. I mean, pressure treated wood, those, those um, chemicals are supposed to keep the wood from decomposing, but eventually it, it may decompose and then some of those chemicals might get released into the compost or the soil. So it's not a good application. Anything All right, else? a few more coming in. All right. Um, are orange peels compostable? Do they need to be cut into small pieces? Orange peels, um, if they're cut into quarters, that would be fine. If they dry out, they get tough as leather. And so like with many things, if they dry out, they're not going to compost very well. But if you bury them in your compost and you have a mix of other ingredients, they should be fine. I have read that you shouldn't put a lot of citric, citrus peels in worm bins. Um, and I have not really, I've done it and I haven't run into any problems. The only thing is when you have a lot of citrus peels, um, in the winter time, say, and you put them all in your worm bin, you might, they, they tend to get a little smelly. So you just can use your nose to judge if it, if it starts to smell, then back off on the orange peels. Um, you could probably put them out in the yard and they would break down that way as well. Although if you have neighbors, they might not, you might want to bury them. But no, they're fine to compost overall. All right, and does it make any difference putting non-native fruit in your compost, such as pineapple or avocado pits in Massachusetts? Um, no, it doesn't matter. Um, composting, home composting is, is I, I, I call it a hyper-local activity, and that's one of the beauty thing, beautiful things about it is, you know, with local gardening and local food eating and local everything being so... Um, desirable these days to be able to make your own compost is as local as you can get, especially if you put in it just things that are from your yard. However, um, it's it's such a it's gonna it's not gonna have any impact on overall impact if you add um, non-native things to your food scraps to your compost pile. So don't worry about it. You might get All a right, pineapple. So. You might get a pineapple growing, or and or avocados growing from your compost pile. So 
if you see things sprouting, just take them out and put them in a pot with a little compost and, and you'll have a new plant. Great. Um, what is the best thing to do when things in the worm bin get heavily moldy, like blue powder covered lemon wedges? Is that mold add, toxic or harmful? Um, bury them down below and add paper on top. I always, with a worm bin, you, um, you can add as much paper as you want. Um, if, and you don't, if you add too much food scraps, I think of a worm bin as sort of a, a very small compost operation. So you can't put in as much material as you could put in an outdoor pile. So um, you kind of can just use your judgment and use your nose. If it starts to smell or you start to get fruit flies, then back off adding food scraps. But, um, but no, if, if it gets moldy, it seems like it's probably a good moisture level, which the worms need. But I would just try to cover it with uh, about four inches of ripped up paper or other, and you can use paper towels or um, the um, paper towel cores or toilet paper cores or um, paper bags or shredded newspapers, um, those types of things. And just keep it, and, and you can't overdo the paper. So just keep adding paper whenever you have it available. And that will keep the, I keep the top layer of my worm bin dry. And then down when I dig into it to add stuff to it, it's damp, but then I cover it back over with dry stuff. Great, that's good, let's keep moving. All right, so how to compost. You want your food for those microbes, carbon and nitrogen. Moisture is about 50% is what you want. Oxygen, whether you get it in there passive or passively or actively, just get it in there. And um, habitable temperature, if you read up, uh, if you want hot compost, which is an, op an optional thing, I usually don't get hot compost because you need a big pile to be built all at once. And then the microbes go, go thrive and flourish and, and the pile heats up. But most of the time I have a bucket here, a bucket there, and it's not enough. But if you want your pile to maintain its heat and not freeze solid through the winter, it should be um, a minimum of one cubic yard, which is you can convert to three feet by three feet by three feet, or any variation thereof that works out to 27 cubic feet. And that is a big enough mass that it will insulate itself. Again, when you have a worm bin, it's in a tiny little 14 gallon bucket, so you can compost in any size container, but you might read this if you want, you know, a hot active, it, the most like optimal size for an outdoor compost pile would be uh, one cubic yard or 27. Optional ingredients. Uh, people sometimes wonder if they need to add commercial compost starter. That's basically dried up bacteria and it's optional. If you add some soil from outdoors or some compost if you have it or some horse manure, that will add the bacteria in there. And once you get it in, as long as you leave some compost in the bottom of your compost bin after you've um, taken out the comp finished compost, always leave a little bit in there and that's like your sourdough starter. That'll help your next batch to be going and you won't have to worry about keep continually adding these these items. Once it's in there, it's like your oven is preheated and it'll keep working. Lime, sometimes people wonder if they should add lime to, it helps reduce odors. And generally you, it's optional, you don't have to do it. And if you do it, will raise the pH and you don't wanna raise the pH too much. So just use a little bit. Wood ashes from a fireplace are also raise the pH. And sometimes people wonder if they can add that. So, and the answer is yes, just be careful that you only, I, I say like, consider it like a condiment like salt and pepper. You just put a little sprinkling in after every 12 inches or so. Don't put a big, dump a big bucket in or, you, or, or it will throw the pH off, off and it might slow things down. You can also sprinkle wood ashes on your, on your yard. It will help raise the pH of your soil. It's good for the grass or your garden. So those are some other things you can do with wood ashes. As I talked about earlier, these are the things you don't want to compost in a low tech system. A backyard system is typically a low tech system and so is a worm bin. A high tech system would be like an anaerobic digestion unit. That, that can handle these items, but in our small little backyard systems, 
we don't want to put these things in, mainly because of the reasons I already said, they'll create odors or could attract animals. Large branches will just get in your way, but small branches are, are typically fine. I have a couple of brush piles myself because I found out that um, uh, birds like to nest in them. So if you have space and you don't mind the aesthetic of a brush pile, it provides habitat for some other creatures and eventually it will break in, they'll break down in their own time. So it's, it's another way to, to handle things that you might otherwise think you have to clean out of your yard. We have a couple more questions about um, things that we can compost. So can you compost shredded uh, white office paper? Yes, you can. You can also recycle it and then it will be made back into paper. So that's typically what we recommend. But if you have a shortage of carbon, you can just rip up your office paper. And I've been known to put some old material, some old um, confidential papers that I didn't want, I didn't have a shredder. I put them in my worm bin and no one will ever read those documents. And um, can compostable silverware be composted in yard systems? It'll take forever, but theoretically it supposedly can be composted. A lot of compostable um, silverware is um, rated to be composted in a commercial facility where it will be shredded up and subjected to very high temperatures, which will help it to decompose. And I've tried different, tried different compostable materials in my worm bins or even my outdoor compost piles without great success. They just, um, I'm not convinced that they really do decompose because to me, if something is biodegradable, the bacteria should be able to biodegrade it in a worm bin or a compost bin. And if it doesn't, then I'm like, meh, if it's still there a year later, then meh, I'm not gonna keep using it. So you can try anything. I I tried composting Dipsy cups because I thought they were wax paper, which they are, and wax will decompose. So wax cardboard you can actually compost or wax cups. Most of the time it's plastic and you think it's wax, like milk cartons you used to be wax coated, but now they're plastic coated and the plastic will just remain. Um, anyway, I tried Dixie cups and I ended up with these little circles of, um, little circles of plastic film in my compost and I couldn't figure out why and it was the bottom of the Dixie cup has a plastic lining so you can, it's very difficult to distinguish but if you get plastic in your compost you can you can remove it so it's not the end of the world any other and questions? somebody asked somebody asked if an earth machine compost bin is three by three by three no an earth machine is 10 cubic feet which is about one third of 27 cubic feet um, so it, it will, it, if it doesn't heat up, that, that's probably why. Um, but it, like I said, it will still work. Even the smaller bins will still work. Other, anything else? Good to go. Okay, so along the lines of what else not to add to your compost would be toxic materials like pesticides. Um, hopefully you don't use pesticides in your yard, um, but if you do, then you don't really want to add um, those materials to your compost, or if you do, make sure you let them compost for at least a year, um, and and usually time will will degrade those um, if you if you should have them. Um, petroleum products um, are are not good, not like gasoline, chlorine. If you add water from your swimming pool and it has chlorine in it, it it will kind of kill off the microbes in the compost. So don't add that. And treated wood, as, as I mentioned before, sometimes those chemicals can leach out into, your, into the compost. Um, trash, stuff like glass, metal, and plastic was never really alive, so it's not going to decompose and it's just going to end up being an unsightly item in your compost in your garden. So just don't put those in. And then for best results, try to exclude diseased plants. Um, a lot of those diseases will actually get killed off by the compost organisms. So it's not the end of the world if some get into your compost. But you know, you can, this is one of these things you, you, you use your own judgment on and it will be fine. Weeds that have gone to seed, as I said, the seed, if it's something you never want to see again, then don't put those seeds in your compost pile. When I have a lot of weeds that, or, or plant material that I don't really want to spread in my yard, I put, I add it to my brush pile. I have like a, a, an outdoor pile in the woods that 
is really never going to see the light of day. And so most things, most weeds need sun to grow. And if it's in a shady brush pile, you can put them out there. And, and you know what happens is the birds will use them for nesting material. So it's all good. Um, if you forget to weed your garden, throw it out back and, and in a shady spot. Um, weeds that spread by roots and runners could, could spread in your compost as well. You can actually kill them off um, by spreading them out on a hard surface like a driveway and letting them get all dried and crispy. And then they could be added to your brush pile and they won't re-sprout. And then invasive plant parts, um, like um, any piece of a bittersweet plant, um, for instance, can re-sprout and the seeds as well. So if you have invasive plants in your yard or your woods, um, we always recommend that you just put those in the trash so that you don't continue to spread those like garlic mustard or loose purple loose drive. So these things, although purple loose drive is pretty, but anyway, um, if you if you're if you have invasives that you know of, then you should just put those in the trash. And then as we've talked about, these are the variety of things you can compost. I didn't mention pine needles. If you have pine needles, you can compost those, but they do take a long time to decompose. And we recommend not to fill your bin up with more than about 10% pine needles, um, or it will really take a long time to decompose and it might become acidic, uh, your compost. So, but what I do recommend with pine needles is that you can use those as a mulch, especially around, um, conifers like pine trees or rhododendrons or blueberries, all those kind of evergreens will thrive with pine needle mulch. So use them that way. Um, yeah, so yep, the source of nitrogens, which are not always green, um, can be a little confusing, but um, we think <laughs> it, it, greens is a little easier than nitrogen in, in terms, but it's not exact. Oh, carbon to nitrogen ratio. This is probably a little more detailed than I really want to go into. Just, um, I'll just say that when you're reading about composting, you might read that the carbon to nitrogen ratio, that's basically the, the amount of carbon to the amount of nitrogen. It's a ratio. Um, and on the molecular weight level, it should be 30 to one to get fast, hot composting. However, if the carbon to nitrogen, if it gets higher than that, um, like say with a leaf pile, like it says here, browns, they may rank, every ingredient has its own unique carbon to nitrogen ratio. So um, it's a math project to come up with a ratio where all, everything you add will average out to 30 to one. And it's just too hard to really do it. So we've created a simple little um, three to one, three parts brown to one part green. Basically by weight, you want to generally about half and half, but since the browns tend to be lighter, we say put in more browns and to, to the amount of greens. So that's where we came up with this simple rule of thumb to achieve an average 30 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio is to build a pile using a mix of about three parts brown to one part green. For example, 75% leaves and 25% grass clippings with vegetative food scraps. Um, and that will approximate that 30 to 1 ratio. As I said, if you just put in leaves, it'll be higher than 30 to 1, but it'll still decompose. It might take longer than if it's mixed with greens, but that's okay as long as you're not in a huge hurry. And you can interchange any of the other ingredients from the browns and greens category to, to use that. And as I said, use your, use your, um, use your nose well, somewhere in here it says use your nose. If it smells, then add more carbon material, basically. Here's some examples. Um, this is at Marshfield Fair. We have a little composting going on behind the administration building in three new age composters. And we put in the high nitrogen material, and then we use cardboard and hay and straw for our carbon material and water it when needed and cover it. And then the following year, we come back and harvest the compost and give it out at the fair. So um, yeah, that works well. Moisture is important. It should be, as we said, about 50% moisture. And how can you tell? Basically, it should be damp to the touch and not dripping wet. If it's dripping wet, then it's too wet. 
if it's if the leaves rustle when you stir them then they're too dry and if it's too wet you can add more paper shred up some paper bags like you can see up here and throw those in or some dry leaves and if it's too um, dry you can add some coffee grounds and other damp materials and if it's still too dry then add some water or let it get rained on so that's not too hard but you do have to if basic the basic rule of thumb is if your compost pile dries out it will just sit there forever <laughs> so that's a lot of times people are saying like they'll say to me like my compost nothing happened and i'm like is it dry and they're like yeah and i say so that's why it just it sort of goes into uh dormancy and the good thing is all you have to do is add water to, and it will start composting again so just like betty crocker just add water and it will you'll get your brownies might not be edible but it will look like brownies so in the end so it's not too difficult. Figure out a system that works best for you. Sometimes a way of getting water into your pile is when you, if you have a food waste bucket and you take it out to the compost, you can rinse it out and then dump the rinse water into your compost pile as a way of getting more moisture. Do we have questions? No. We have one, which I think is kind of fun. How do acorns do in compost? they last a long time but eventually they will decompose <clears throat> so i tend to pile up the acorns in a corner for the squirrels and then after a long time they'll eventually i, I do it on a rock because if i do it on the ground they will sprout um, in a compost bin they might sprout and they might you know they might last a long time but if you're not in a hurry it, you can compost them um, if you leave them in a pile on a rock, they won't sprout as easily and you'll and then they'll turn into like a wood mulch. Quite nice. So compost systems. Um, generally, if, if, if you're composting food scraps, you want it to be an enclosed system. If it's just leaves, you, it can be a, a leaf pile. It doesn't have to even be enclosed. If you have rodents in your area, like if you live in the city and there's already a rat problem in your neighborhood or in the whole city, then you want to really have a secure compost container. And you can do that by covering the whole thing with um, half inch wire mesh or using a metal trash can with holes drilled in it is easier. Um, as we said, volume will help maximize the co hot composting, but again, it's not a requirement. If you have a built-in aeration system in your design, like a turner, or in the case of the New Age composter, it's got a floor that aerates it, that's nice. Um, it should be easy for, to use. You don't want it to be you know, so difficult that you can't manage it. And if, if, um, and if you don't have a yard, a deck, or a porch, you can have an indoor system. So these are the compost bins that MassDEP has on state contract and about 150 cities and towns across the state sell them at a discount and maybe $25. They cost, these are the costs that they actually cost that the town pays. So for the bin 24, which is the, tw the, the original and it's 24 cubic foot capacity, that, those now cost $59. So if your town sells them for less, then they are giving you a subsidy and a discount. Um, and that's a great thing. And DEP actually has a grant program where we incentivize towns to do that. So if you aren't sure if your town sells compost bins, probably the easiest way is to go on your town's web or city's website and go on the recycling page and then see if it's on there. And if not, you could do a little search on compost bins and if they sell them, it will generally come up. Um, we have a list on our website on, at, at mass.gov. So you can do that as well. Just go to mass.gov and then type compost bins in the search box and you'll come up with the page that has the bins and the list of towns that we know of that sell them, but that's kind of always changing. So um, you can check locally as well. This bin is made in New Bedford out of recycled detergent bottles. And, when it and it's got a cone-shaped floor and cover and that helps hold in air and keep animal, hold in moisture and keep animals out, but it has holes in the cover so rain can get in and air can get in. And then the cone-shaped floor, this is a cutaway view, it's kind of confusing to see, but it, it protrudes up into the bottom of the pile and it has holes in it. 
and so it aerates it from below. This shows some detergent bottles with the caps on underneath the cone to help hold it up so it won't collapse. It also comes with a brace that goes under there, or you can put rocks under it to keep it from collapsing. Because what happens is it aerates itself 24 seven, and it's the easiest, simplest um, process I've ever seen. So I try to keep the, the, the floor um, up intact. And then, um, so some towns sell these, some towns don't. Um, if your town doesn't, there's a place in Boston that sells them called the Boston Building Resources. And they sell building materials and compost bins and rain barrels, and they sell to anybody. So if you're, you can go there and they have a website, it's bostonbuildingresources.com. And they're doing sales now as well. They have a, a certain way of doing it. So um, you can contact them to, to get a bin there. Another bin on state contract is, as someone mentioned, is the Earth Machine. And this one is 10 cubic foot capacity. It costs um, 49, almost $50. So a lot of towns sell them for 25, which is a great discount. They have a little door at the bottom, which makes getting the compost out a little bit easier. Um, and, but they do have a solid cover. So I found when I, when I added leaves to this bin, I needed to take the cover off when it rains so the, the rain could get in. I find sometimes that when people get this bin, it's, it's about the size of a trash can, a little bit bigger, but it, people think it's just for food scraps. So then they fill it with food scraps and it gets to be a stinky, slimy mess. So even if you have a small bin, you, you still need to add some carbon material, whether it's leaves or paper. But they, um, they work fine. And then we have this other bin on state contract. It's a little pricey, so I don't know of anyone that actually sells it at this point, $154. Um, and it's a dual compost tumbler, and it's sold by this company, Go Green Solutions. If your town doesn't sell them and you wanted one of these, you can just go on their website. They, they sell them for like $169 retail because the state contract price is, is a wholesale price. So um, you might have to pay a little more, but... Um, it, you know, if you have a deck or something, it might it might work out well for you because it's all contained. It's seven cubic foot capacity. Each of these drums has three and a half cubic feet. So it's not a high um, capacity composter, but I'm sure it still works fine. Where should I put my compost bins? I use the word bins, plural, because the, the, <clears throat> the more the better. Because if you have one bin and you fill it up, and then you start a second bin and fill that one up and it takes you six months to fill up each one. By the time you filled up your second bin, your first bin should be just compost and you should just be able to easily access your finished compost. So that's the sort of how the three bin turning system came about because people had like a bin for fresh stuff and they turn it into and there would be the medium stuff and then they'd have the third bin would be for the finished stuff. But that involves turning. But if you do have two or more bins, you can use them in sequentially and it makes it just much easier to access your finished compost. So how much space do you have that will Im impact upon that? You want it to be convenient. Don't put, put it way out back because then you'll never go out there. And you, won't, you have to be able to reach it with your hose in case it dries out. And, and not a, and, Proximity to water source is a faucet, not wetlands. Some people fill up their wetlands with leaves and that's not, um, it's not a good practice. We don't wanna fill up wetlands with leaves even though leaves are natural. Uh, they don't, we don't wanna fill wetlands with them. We wanna leave wetlands to be wetlands. Um, appearance, where, you know, how does it look? Um, my main thing is I try to make it invisible or put it somewhere where no one can see it that way out of sight, out of mind. Drainage, you don't want it to be in a puddle of standing water. Exposure, whether it's in the sun or the shade, it really doesn't matter. The sun will heat it up a little more, but it will also dry it out a little faster. Whereas the shade, it won't get as much external heat, but it won't evaporate, the water won't evaporate as quickly. So it's six to one half dozen of the other, whichever kind of location you want, it will work in. And you know, you'll read different things where some will say it's better in the sun and some will say it's better in the shade. Eh, it's six of one, half dozen of the other, really. Environmental considerations, as I said, not in a wetland. Um, 
put it near your gardens or where the compost will be used. That's the, you know, that should be, make it convenient. And with your neighbors, basically, if you can avoid problems, that's better than having to deal with them later. So try to keep it out of sight and it will be out of mind. Try to keep it from getting a terrible odor. If it gets a terrible odor, a quick remedy is to cover your compost pile with about three inches of soil and it will just filter out the odors. And then just wait. And after about three months, you can dig in there and see if it's calmed down. Um, but you don't wanna dig into a stinky pile because you'll just release that stench. So just cover it with soil, let it do its thing, and eventually it will, it'll take care of itself. <laughs> but try to keep it, that from happening if you can. Tools of the trade, what do you need? Well, my basic tools are gloves, a hose, um, a cultivator, which is this thing here, uh, a little trowel, a hoe, because I use a, this bin that um, a pitchfork isn't gonna work with this bin, so I use a hoe and a shovel for harvesting the compost. And you might want some buckets if you don't have a wheelbarrow. Wheelbarrow is optional. Um, if you don't need a wheelbarrow, you don't have room for a wheelbarrow, you can just put your compost in buckets. How do you get your compost out of your bin that you've been adding to it all year? Well, around this time of year, if you haven't been adding too much, it should just be pretty much dried leaves on the top and then you can just put your gloves on and dig down and you'll get to this brown looking stuff and it's almost like soil it may still have some leaves but if it's been there six months to a year even if there's some bits of leaves if it's mostly soil like then it's fine to use you can just take it out put it in a bucket and then you can either use it for seedlings or you can mix it and put it with in your house plants and as i said if there's still some bits of leaves they'll just decompose the rest of the way over time and um, don't worry about it. It doesn't have to be 100% decomposed in order for it to still be beneficial. Another way is to take your cultivator and peel back the, the, the leaves or even a hoe and peel back the leaves from one side to the other till you get to the compost underneath and then either put it with a trowel, dig it out with a trowel into a bucket or dig it out with a shovel into a wheelbarrow. And that's about 15 minutes later. I got half this bin emptied and um, it's not totally composted, but it's only April. So I actually just did this for the photo. I actually put it back in my bin because if it sits, I don't need it right this very minute. So when I need it, it'll be there. And it, the longer it sits in your bin, the more composted it will become. And if you don't want to screen your compost, just let it get to be a year old and it eventually will be like as if it had been screened. What about um, prunings? I had this plant that had, it was all full of these dead stalks and I pruned it way back. And then I had a big pile of these brown dead stalks and I'm like, well, those are brown ingredients. So I'll put them in my compost bin, which it then filled up. So I'm like, well, that's not very, gonna work very effectively. So I took my little pruning shears and I cut them up into smaller pieces. And I discovered that it was actually easier to break them up with my gloved hands than to, prune them, but this is just to give you the idea. And by the time I crushed them all up and broke them into small pieces, uh, my bin was ready to still go. It wasn't all full. So, you know, it's, it's easy. It took me about 10 minutes. So if you don't have a yard or other outdoor space, try composting indoors by making a worm bin. No one has to know unless you want them to. This is where they won't know. And then if you want them to know, you turn it around and put a sign on it. But you know, generally this is a pretty innocuous container that I keep in my kitchen. This is my kitchen actually. And I keep it, I, this is my little recycling station, my trash, my recycling and my, and my composting. So when it's time to add some, I make a salad and I have a piece of lettuce that came off or, or a carrot bottom, um, I open up my bin and this is what it looks like because I keep paper on the top of it. And then I, um, I'm showing this with gloves. Truthfully, I don't usually wear gloves, but I figured I'd be on the conservative side and just show you with gloves, <laughs> a little less gross. I mean, I don't think it's gross at all. And if you do it, if you don't overfeed it, it won't smell. I'm, I'm serious when I say this is in my kitchen, I can't smell it, partly because it's on the floor. If it was at nose level, I might smell it um, and it would just be an earthy smell. 
but I keep it on the floor and it's um, literally, I don't smell it. No one knows it's there. Um, so anyway, uh, open it up and, and on the top, it's going to look like this because I keep dried paper as the top layer. So I take this little plastic trowel that I have to dig down. I dig a little hole till I get to the, the damp part. That's where the worms are. And then I use, I, I collect my stuff in a little recycling container. I don't even have a fancy wor uh, food waste scrap bucket because it just goes straight in the worm bin. The onion peels and the coffee grounds go in there and I cover it back up with paper and close it back up and, and, that's, and that's that. And as long as you add about a cup each time and maybe every two to three days, if you put in like a couple cups every, of food scraps every day into a bin of this size, which is about a 14 gallon bin, it will overwhelm the, the, wor the composting process. The reason you add worms to your, to your compost bin, I don't know if I, I don't have a picture of the worms handy, but um, it speeds up the compost process and it aerates it. So that's the reason. You could compost indoors without worms, um, but um, the worms speed it up. But the whole process is very similar to the outdoor process. It requires microbes to break the stuff down and then the worms eat the slimy stuff that the microbes have broken down. So it's not like they have teeth and they can just do everything you know, really quickly. So it takes a little time. So just don't overfeed it. Start small and if you can't smell it, then you can add more. Add the food scraps to a different part of the bin each time. So then it, like first you add it, dig a hole here, bury it. Then next time, dig a hole here, bury it. Then next time, dig a hole over here and bury it. And then go back here and bury it. And then by the time you get back here, this stuff you buried here should be brown, look, look like this, and then you're good to go again. So that's kind of the, in a nutshell, how to do it. Now you don't want to get fruit flies. The trouble with indoor composting are fruit flies and fungus gnats. So if you do, so the easiest way of not getting fruit flies in a worm bin is number one, don't overfeed it with fruit scraps. Number two, and to do that, just use your judgment. Um, you know, like I said, if you can't smell it and you just put in a little bit each time and it starts to disappear before you add more, then you're fine. Another thing you can do is put your food scraps in the freezer first for three days or so or a week. And then that, I don't know the exact length of time it takes, but after a couple of days, the fruit fly larvae that are on that fruit waste or that could be on the fruit waste will be killed by being frozen. So then you pull it out of your freezer, let it thaw for an hour, uh, a couple hours, because you don't want to freeze out your worms. Um, let it thaw and then dump it in your worm bin. So that way I've been doing that at the office. And um, I have a, a couple worm bins at, at the office and um, in the basement actually, because um, it wasn't well welcomed in the actual office space because I got fungus gnats, <laughs> which people didn't like. Fungus gnats like fungus. So the trick, that's why I've learned to keep the top layer of paper dry. And that tends to reduce the attraction of fungus gnats. But anyway, if you get fruit flies, Stop adding fruit or food waste to your worm bin. Keep adding paper scraps because that'll kind of put a barrier down and help reduce any odors that's attracting the fruit flies. But don't add any more um, fruit until you've trapped all your fruit flies. You make a trap. These are holes in the top of a plastic container that I punched with a knife. And I just punched these holes that are about a quarter of an inch in diameter so a fruit fly can get in. Then you take the container and you pour some red wine vinegar um, into it or put some banana peels in there and leave it on the counter, not in your worm bin, but near your, near your worm bin, on the counter somewhere. And the worm, the fruit flies, if they are around, will go through these holes to get into that red wine vinegar and um, they'll either drown or you can take it outside and open it up and let them go outdoors. You can also use a banana peel as bait as well and that way they won't drown. So if you don't want to drown the fruit flies, um, use a banana peel as bait. The other way I said I prevent myself from getting fruit flies, or I think it helps, is I put my banana peels straight out in the garden around the plants um, because they do tend to be linked with fruit flies. Um, so yeah, that's about it for that. And these are some resources. Um, the Mass DEP has a web page that if it, here's the link. It's it's home composting and green landscaping resources. There's all kinds of resources on there. That's the link, but if you if you lose the link or you just want to look around, just go to mass.gov of the, of the website 
And from there, you can go in the search box and type in compost bins or composting. It'll bring you to this page. Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection has these great videos. There's other ones there as well as the one we saw today. And those are available for free. So you can go there and watch those. Cornell University has some great composting resources of all kinds, including home composting and worm composting. You get more material there. The US Composting Council has some, um, a lot of information and including a fact sheet on composting, residential composting during COVID-19. You can read that. It basically says the composting process will, will kill off the coronavirus. Just make sure you wash your hands after you compost like usual, it's, it's, it's really no new different practice. Also, but, but any surface that you touch in the compost process, like if you have a kitchen scrap pail, make sure you clean the, the handle of the pail like you would everything else in your kitchen. And um, that should be fine. If you wanna get earthworms, you can find them outdoors under the leaves. You, they're, na they're naturally occurring. Um, I have a picture, but I didn't have time to include it, unfortunately, but, um, you can just dig down under a leaf, a, a pile of leaves in the woods, and most likely you'll find some little red wigglers, and you can just bring those indoors and add them to your worm bin. If you can't find any worms or you don't have access to leaves on the ground, um, you can order them. You can go online to find places to order them. Um, we, this is a place in Connecticut that we've used for the Green Team program um, to purchase worms for schools. I didn't mention the Green Team. We promote composting for schools. So if you're teaching your kids now, go to thegreenteam.org, including the word the, and there's all kinds of composting resources on there, lesson plans and everything as well. So you're welcome to, that's all free. Welcome to use those materials. And then if you want to get your soil tested, UMass has a soil testing lab. So um, it's always a good idea to get your soil tested to see how it's doing. Um, and I guess that's about it. Some books, so Rodale Guide to Composting for Worm Composting. Worms Eat My Garbage is a classic and still a great um, resource. BioCycle is a journal about composting that's great. And Organic Gardening, well, you might have to go to Back Issues because they don't make that anymore, but there's other magazines. But yeah, I just realized that's no longer with us, unfortunately. So um, here's my contact information. You're welcome to email me or call me. I'm check I'm working remotely, but I'm checking my voicemail. So if you leave me a message or send me an email, I will get back to you. So that's about it. And it, I think we're at the end of our time. If anyone has any more questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Yep, we got a few more. So we had somebody um, suggest that I uh, should limit the number of oak leaves because of the tannins in an outdoor or in composting in general. Um, would they also be acidic as well? That's a great question. I'm glad someone made that comment because it's, you might read that, but in reality, when you are in an oak far, they, they could be acidic, but typically even acidic material, this is one of the mysteries of composting that is not completely understood but you can add acidic materials like even coffee grounds or oak leaves into a compost pile. And by the time those microbes have decomposed it into humus, the pH is gonna be right around neutral. It's, but let's, it's not magic, but it's like magic. So don't worry about oak leaves. I have tons of oak leaves in my yard and I actually use them as mulch because I have more than I can compost. Plus, when you use oak leaves for mulch um, or any kind of leaves, if you use leaves for mulch, they will decompose in place and build up the soil. So it's almost like um, it's easier than, than putting in a compost pile and then taking it back out. You can actually, you just have to get used to the appearance of leaves as mulch, which um, some people don't like. But after a while, when you see how beneficial they are for your soil, um, the tannins will just be mixed in and, and um, into the soil and dissolved and it's not is really it's not a problem and um, so don't worry about oak leaves. The main problem with oak leaves is when they dry out they don't decompose and sometimes people will ask me they'll say I have a lot of oak leaves and they'll never decompose and I and the trick is to add water and a little bit of soil and uh, they dry out they're tough as leather but just like in the woods if they didn't decompose we would be in deep do do or deep leafage because we'd be covered with leaves. They decompose in the woods, they'll decompose in your, in your 
compost pile. So they're all good. Anything else? We also had somebody yeah. suggest um, that you shouldn't put pineapple in with your worm bin because there's an enzyme in pineapple that um, affects the worm. Yes, I'm glad someone raised that point. I was not aware of that until recently. So yes, I that person or someone told me about that and I'm sorry I didn't include it. Um, so don't add pineapple to your worm bin because of the enzyme. And that there's a difference between your sort of generic outdoor worm and red wrigglers, um, that red wrigglers are champion composters. Yes, yes, there's many different kinds of worms. Um, red wigglers, and they're divided by category. One of the main features that distinguishes them from each other is where they dwell in the soil. So the red wigglers, which are small and reddish, I'm sorry, I didn't get a better photo. I, um, but they're, they're only about mm, maybe an inch and a half, maybe two inches at full, uh, if you get a really big one, they're small. And they're red in color. They actually have hemoglobin in them. And they, they're red in color. They're called red wigglers. There's some scientific names, but not, I'm not going to bother you with that. But, um, and, and they're surface dwellers. They live, that's why I said if you go dig under a leaf pile, you might find them. And they're, um, they said like your generic outdoor worms. There's, uh, there's a variety of worms, but the worms that you're likely to find on the surface of decomposing leaf litter or decomposing um, organic matter on the top of the soil is likely to be the red wigglers because those are the surface dwellers. And that's why they're happy, dare I say, they seem to be happy in a worm bin because they live in the top six to eight inches of, of decomposing material. That's their preferred habitat. The garden called garden worms um, tend to go deeper in the soil and they're, they're like mid-level soil dwellers and they're, and they're usually grayer and they're about three inches long. Those are not going to be so happy in your worm bin because they don't, they eat organic material, but that's not their preferred environment. They like taking their leaves and then going down two or three feet. So, um, or maybe 15 inches. The deep dwellers are the night crawlers. Those are the worms that are about six inches long and they go down as far as six feet into the soil and they'll drag their leaves with them and line their burrows and they will not be happy in a worm bin. They'll try and get out because they can't they want to go down deep. So that's the main difference in a nutshell. And they're not, none of them are native, actually. They're all related to the Lumbrica species, which is European, but they were brought over by the early settlers, either, by, either on purpose or by accident with their plant material, whichever it was, they arrived and they've naturalized. And it's mainly a good thing. Basic rule of thumb, wherever the people have cultivated the land and settled, you're very likely to find all these non-native lumbricus earthworms. The good news is they aerate your soil, they add organic matter, and they're, and they're beneficial to gardeners. The rule of thumb or the caveat is don't take your fishing bait up to the northern hardwood forests in the, in the wilderness and release them when you're done fishing because they can eat the leaf litter faster than the normal ecosystem would, would have done without those non-native worms and um, and it can disturb the ecosystem that's in nature so just you know in your garden they may not be native but we love them anyways um, but out in the out in the wilderness areas don't bring them just like you shouldn't bring any non-natives out to a wilderness area so a natural area so that's worms in a nutshell great and then we have somebody asking, um, are there any risks of using on-farm pig manure or chicken manure? What about compared to house man horse manure? Okay, well, chicken manure and, and horse manure are herbivores. And, they're, and for that reason, their manure tends to be less pathogenic to humans than carnivores. And as far as I know, pigs tend to be omnivores. And you could probably compost their manure, but I am not sure. I'm not an expert on pig manure and how safe it may or may not be. If this is one household pig that you have, I would make, I would compost the pig manure in a pig manure pile and put it, put, mix it with enough carbon material and cover it with enough carbon material to, um, to filter out the odors that might be generated. But by the time 
in general, manure, a good rule of thumb, if, you, if you're not sure if, if manure is completely composted, let it compost for a year or more. And by the time this these organisms have been working on it for a year, any pathogens should be, should be gone and it will be just like soil. So does that answer it? I think so. Oh, I didn't really um, talk about so chicken manure. Chicken manure is high in um, nitrogen, so you'll need to add a lot of carbon to make that so it's not too hot and doesn't smell, but it will compost fine. Um, yeah, chicken manure is great and horse manure is great. Horse manure often comes with bedding and the mix of the manure and the bedding is often right around that 30 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio all on its own. So that's why horse manure piles after a year or so um, will shrink down and, and, comp and make a beautiful compost. A lot of times you can find red wiggler worms in old horse manure piles. I forgot to mention that. So if you have a source of horse manure and you, get to, you dig into the pile and you see red wiggler, these little red worms, those are your compost worms and you can bring those indoors. And that's also a sign that your compost is safe to use because it's not hot enough to kill off the earthworms. Fresh manure tends to be very hot because of nitrogen. So you want to age it for, and let it compost for at least a year. We did have somebody um, say the guy on the old Victory Garden used to say the best manure for compost is whichever one you can get for free. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Somebody's asking. Yeah. Although I Somebody's have one asking, thing to, I have one thing to add. My, my, the kind of manure I think is the best is the worm manure. I didn't mention that. The worm, it's called worm castings for some reason, I don't know why, but the, but the compost that the worms use is like super duper compost. It makes plants grow like crazy. It makes seeds germinate. They, don't, they think it has some rooting hormones in it or something similar. They don't know exactly why it's so great, but worm manure is, is I think, the best. But any kind you get for free, they're all, they're all good. And do you have, um, I know you had on your previous slide um, a company that was selling the worms, but are there other places? Yes, that there we can are. Get worms? Yes, if you, I didn't, we don't have a state contract for, for worms, so I, I don't really have a listing, but if you go online and, and Google um, or, or search on red worms or compost worms, you'll find other sources as well. Um, there's another source in Massachusetts, actually. Um, I believe they're still selling worms called Mass Natural, and they're in Westminster, Mass. And they started out um, as a chicken farm, and they composted the chicken manure, and then they started adding red wigglers to speed up that process. And now I believe they sell the red wigglers. So if you want local, Mass Natural um, is another source. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we did have somebody who wanted to have you review this sort of um, historical system of burying the food scraps in the yard and then planting above that and then switching where you're planting your garden. Sure, yes. Um, what's it called? Oh, it's sort of. Um, okay, so if you have a space in your yard where you want to garden, what you can do is, oh, trench, that's the word I'm looking for. It's called trench composting. You divide your space up into, um, like say it's a rectangle, divide it up into like three sections lengthwise. And your middle section, the first year, could be your pathway. And then on each side of your pathway, you can dig a trench. Or if you don't have enough room for three, and you just have two, then dig a trench on one side, about six inches, six inches, six to eight inches deep. You don't really have to go too much deeper than that. Say, say eight inches, dig a trench eight inches deep, or you can just do it as you go. You don't, you know, once you get your shovel out there, it might be easier to dig your trench all at once. And then, excuse me, you can put your soil on the side of the trench and then, throw in your food scraps and then take some of the soil from that you've piled up and throw it on top of those food scraps and it will it will um, kill the odor and and it won't attract animals 
and you'll get earthworms coming there because it's like a little surface set worm compost setup. At least that's been my experience with that. So then as often as you have those food scraps, you dump them in your trench and you bury them. Hopefully you don't run out of trench before you run out of time. And then, um, and then the, the following, okay, so that's your trench and then for your garden, so if you only have two, then one side is gonna, you're gonna garden and have a tiny little path in between and have one bed next to your um, trench could be a garden bed and then where you plant. And then the following season, you switch over your trench to where your garden bed was and you, you dig a trench there and start burying your food waste there and then on the side where you had plant buried your food scraps all season, you loosen up the soil and plant your garden there. And you should have nice rich soil and a space to um, dig and bury your food scraps adjacent to that or on the other side of that for that season. And then you just keep switching back and forth each season. Hopefully it works as easily as it sounds. <laughs> Nothing ever is quite as easy in, in practice, but oh, you can make it work. Okay, that's great. I think that we we haven't had any other questions, so I think we're probably all set um, to wrap up. Great. I don't see any other questions coming in, so I just want to say thank you very much for participating and providing us with so much information and we'll post these slides online um, so that folks can take a look at them later. Um, and we just really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. You are welcome. It was my pleasure. It was, um, I, I only miss the hands-on touching. When I give a workshop, I usually pass around some compost. So I miss, yeah. that. I miss, I miss that earthy smell, but hopefully, um, we got the main the main points across. So thanks so much for having me. It was really a lot of fun. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe, stay well, and um, hopefully we'll see everybody on the rest of our fun Earth Week activities. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks, Ann. Thanks, Ann. All right. Take care. Take care. Bye bye.